For more than half a century, the dream of routine, faster-than-sound commercial air travel has captivated the human imagination. It represents the ultimate shrinking of our planet, promising to connect continents in hours rather than half days. Yet this dream effectively stalled in the 1970s, hitting a literal wall of sound. A single thunderous and persistent problem has kept this future at bay. The sonic boom. The loud, concussive, double thunderclap produced by conventional supersonic aircraft is not merely a nuisance. It's an environmental disturbance so significant that it led to international regulations prohibiting supersonic flight over land for civilian aircraft. Now, that barrier is being systematically dismantled. NASA's X-59 Quiet Supersonic Technology QUESST aircraft, an experimental jet developed in a landmark collaboration with Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, is the centerpiece of a mission to overcome this foundational challenge. The X-59 is not just another fast plane. It is a meticulously designed scientific instrument built with the express purpose of transforming the disruptive boom into a subtle, barely perceptible sonic thump. If successful, this unassuming research aircraft could be the key that unlocks the door to a new, faster, and surprisingly quieter era of global aviation. The, the big change that I've noticed in all these years is we went from trying to design the airplane to produce a specific sound on the ground to a process where we let the sound that we want and the airplane design evolve simultaneously. That's really enabled us to design an airplane that not only is quiet, but it also meets the, all the other performance requirements of a good airplane. It can take off and land, it's efficient at cruise, it performs well. So within a few years, we went from, this is really hard to, hey, we could really do this. So that was very exciting that in that, in that time period. A sonic boom is the audible consequence of an object violating the sound barrier. As an aircraft travels through the air, it continuously creates pressure waves, much like a boat creates a wake in the water. At subsonic speeds, these waves propagate forward from the aircraft. However, as the plane accelerates to and beyond Mach 1, the speed of sound, it outruns its own pressure waves. These waves can't get out of the way fast enough and begin to coalesce, forming two primary intense shock waves, one at the nose, the bow shock, and one at the tail, the tail shock. These shock waves are cones of high pressure that travel outward from the aircraft. When this pressure cone intersects with the ground, it is heard by an observer as a sudden dramatic change in pressure, the sonic boom. This is why it is often described as a double boom, as the ear perceives the instantaneous pressure rise from the bow shock, followed milliseconds later by the sudden pressure drop from the tail shock. This specific acoustic signature is known as an N wave for the N shape it creates on a pressure graph. For a conventional supersonic aircraft like a fighter jet or the Concorde, this N wave is incredibly powerful registering at 105 decibels or more. This is a sound loud enough to startle livestock, rattle buildings, and in some cases, shatter windows. Whenever a sonic boom came, our chickens quit laying eggs. And uh, there were lots of windows broken in the city, and people were complaining about that. It is this core physical and environmental problem that the X-59 was built to solve. No discussion of supersonic travel is complete without acknowledging the Concorde, a joint Anglo-French marvel of engineering. The Concorde was a technological triumph that, for a quarter century, ferried passengers across the Atlantic at twice the speed of sound. However, its story perfectly illustrates the very problem the X-59 seeks to fix. Due to its powerful N-wave boom, the Concorde was restricted by the Federal Aviation Administration and other international bodies to flying at its top speed only over ocean. 
as it approached or departed from airports like London Heathrow, JFK in New York, or Charles de Gaulle in Paris, it was required to fly at subsonic speeds, effectively operating as a conventional and highly inefficient jetliner. This restriction severely limited its route network and economic viability. It could not fly from New York to Los Angeles or London to Singapore overland, which would have been revolutionary. The public outcry that led to these bans was not theoretical. During the 1960s, the U.S. government conducted the Oklahoma City bombing tests, where they deliberately flew military jets supersonically over the city for months to gauge public tolerance. The result was widespread complaints and thousands of claims for damages. The message was clear. The public would not accept the sonic boom as a daily occurrence. The Concorde, for all its beauty and speed, was an economic and environmental dead end. The world needed a different approach. The central premise of the X-59 is that the shape of an aircraft can be specifically tailored to manipulate its shockwaves. The X-59's design is the culmination of decades of research in computational fluid dynamics, CFD, and wind tunnel testing. The goal is not to eliminate the shockwaves, that is a physical impossibility, but to prevent them from coalescing into the powerful in-wave. The X-59 is designed to generate a shaped pressure wave, often called an S-wave. Instead of two massive pressure changes, the X-59's unique outer mold line, OML, is engineered to create a series of many smaller, much more spread out shock waves. By the time these gentle pressure ripples reach the ground, they are perceived as a quiet, low frequency thump, which NASA compares to the sound of a car door closing in the distance. The target for this sound is a mere 75 perceived level decibels, PLDB, a tiny fraction of the Concorde's roar. But soon after sonic booms became a regular thing, the military advanced very quickly, uh, having supersonic capable aircraft. And then really very soon after that, we began to see the ideas for supersonic airliners. So it was really very exciting and it, it really had a lot of possibility. But the military, where sonic boom first was kind of a novelty, it pretty rapidly became apparent that on a large-scale basis, the noise was just not going to be acceptable. The long, slender nose. The most striking feature of the X-59 is its extraordinary nose. The aircraft is nearly 100 feet long, and its sharply tapered nose makes up almost a third of that length. This is not an aesthetic choice. It is the primary tool for shaping the boom. This long, slender beak is designed to be the first point of contact with the air, gently parting it and creating the first weak shockwave. The rest of the aircraft's body is designed to follow this initial gentle disturbance, preventing the formation of a stronger, coalesced bow shock. Aerodynamic Sculpting Every external feature of the X-59 is a boom-shaping tool. The canards, small wings, and the main wings are all meticulously designed and placed using advanced computer modeling. Each of these surfaces generates its own set of shockwaves. The challenge, solved by supercomputers, was to ensure that none of these individual shockwaves could ever catch up to and merge with one another, which would amplify the sound. The result is an aircraft that looks almost organic, sculpted by airflow rather than conventional design. Top-mounted engine. In a highly unusual design choice, the X-59's single General Electric F414 GE100 engine, the same power plant used in the FA-18 Super Hornet, is mounted on top of the fuselage, tucked behind the wing. This placement is twofold. First, it helps to direct the noise from the engine's exhaust upward away from the ground. Second, and more importantly, it shields the shock waves generated by the engine's air inlet from reaching the ground, further contributing to the aircraft's quiet profile. The optimized flight profile. 
The X-59 is designed to cruise at its target speed of Mach 1.4, around 925 miles per hour, at an altitude of 55,000 feet. This high altitude is a crucial part of the low boom equation. The extra 10 miles of atmosphere between the aircraft and the ground gives the already weak shockwaves more time in distance to dissipate and spread out, further softening the thump before it ever reaches a human ear. The X-59's most radical design feature, its long nose, creates a radical engineering problem. The pilot has no forward-facing window. The cockpit is recessed deep into the fuselage, and the view ahead is completely obstructed. To solve this, Lockheed Martin developed the External Visibility System. It's not a simple backup camera. It is a complex, high-definition, virtual window. The system uses two high-resolution cameras mounted on the front of the aircraft, which are combined with sophisticated terrain data from an advanced computer system. This fused image is then fed to a 4K monitor in the cockpit, right where the windscreen would normally be. This display provides the pilot with a clear, augmented reality view, allowing them to safely navigate, take off, land, and see other air traffic. The XVS is a critical piece of technology in its own right. It represents a paradigm shift in cockpit design, and its validation on the X-59 could have implications for future aircraft designs, both supersonic and subsonic, by allowing engineers to create more aerodynamic shapes without being constrained by the need for a forward-facing bubble of glass. The X-59 was built at Lockheed Martin's legendary Skunk Works division in Palmdale, California, the same secretive, rapid prototyping facility responsible for some of aviation's most iconic aircraft, including the U-2 spy plane, the SR-71 Blackbird, and the F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighter. The X-59 continues this X-plane, experimental aircraft, lineage, but to manage the costs and schedule of a one-of-a-kind demonstrator, the team cleverly blended bespoke, cutting-edge technology with reliable, off-the-shelf components. While the fuselage, wings, and control systems are all custom-built, the X-59 utilizes the landing gear from an F-16 fighter jet, the cockpit's ejection seat from a T-38 trainer, and parts of the propulsion system from the F-A-18. This philosophy of smart sourcing allowed the team to focus resources on the parts that truly mattered for the mission, the low boom aerodynamic shape and the XVS. The X-59 itself is merely the tool. The true mission, Quest, is divided into two critical phases that are as much about sociology as they are about aeronautics. Phase one, acoustic validation. After its successful maiden test flight on October 28, 2025, which validated its airworthiness and safety at subsonic speeds, the X-59 will begin the careful process of envelope expansion. The test pilots will gradually push the aircraft higher and faster, eventually reaching its Mach 1.4 cruise speed. During this phase, NASA will conduct acoustic validation by flying the X-59 over a vast, 30-mile-long array of ground-based high-fidelity microphones in the skies above a test range. This acoustic carpet will capture a complete sound profile of the sonic thump, proving with hard data that the aircraft's real-world performance matches the computer models. Phase 2. Community Response Testing this is the most critical part of the entire mission, and it's what will ultimately determine the future of supersonic flight. Once the X-59's quiet performance is validated, NASA will fly the aircraft over several carefully selected U.S. communities, representing a diverse range of demographic and geographic environments. As the X-59 flies over these towns, its thump will be measured by ground sensors, but more importantly, residents will be surveyed to determine their real-world response. Did they hear it? Was it annoying? Was it startling? 
Did they even notice it at all over the normal sounds of a car door closing or distant thunder? This collected data, linking the scientifically measured 75 PLDB sound to a statistically valid public perception of that sound, is the linchpin of the entire mission. The data from the QSST mission will not, by itself, lift the ban on supersonic flight. Its purpose is to give regulators the evidence they need to change the rules. Currently, the FAA ban is a blunt instrument. Civilian aircraft are forbidden from flying faster than Mach 1 over land. NASA's goal is to provide the FAA and international regulators, like the ICAO, with the data to create a new, modern, and more logical standard, one based not on speed, but on sound. If the community tests are successful, regulators could establish a new noise-based standard, such as an acceptable perceived decibel level for overland flight. This would create a level playing field, effectively telling the aviation industry, we don't care how fast you fly, as long as you are no louder than X on the ground. This is the future the X-59 is built to enable. It is the enabler for a new generation of commercial aircraft. Companies like Boom Supersonic, Hermes, and others are already designing Son of Concord airliners, but they are all waiting for the X-59 to prove that a quiet supersonic aircraft is possible and for regulators to open the market. If this mission succeeds, the implications are immense. A new generation of commercial aircraft capable of flying at Mach 1.4 or higher could revolutionize travel and logistics. A flight from Los Angeles to New York could be cut to under three hours. A trip from San Francisco to Tokyo could become an easy day trip. The X-59 is more than just an experimental jet. It is a catalyst for regulatory change and a symbol of aviation's next great leap. It is the quietest revolution in aerospace, promising to finally deliver on the 20th century dream of supersonic travel by solving its most fundamental flaw. The era of the loud disruptive boom is ending and the era of the quiet gentle thump is at last on the horizon. Enjoyed the episode? Like and subscribe to Military Forces. For more in-depth content, your support helps us create more.